الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد All praise due to Allah uh, This is our, our first uh, class and lesson we're going to have every Thursday uh, after Maghrib prayer and we're going to talk about a very very important and beautiful uh, subject which is the biography and the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how uh, we say in Arabic Seerah Seerah al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I have to say first that before anything if you want to value something or you want to get close to something or you want to love something the first thing you need to do is you need to understand what that thing is that's why Allah, Allah, our Creator, if you wanted to be a believer in Allah, you have to know your Creator. And that is why many of the scholars, they say, you have to know about Aqeedah, you have to know about monotheism, Tawheed Allah, and then you have to know about the names and attributes of Allah. You know that Allah is all merciful, that Allah is seeing you, that Allah is all powerful, that Allah is all these names and attributes of Allah, the more you learn about it, the more you know Allah. And the more you know Allah, the more you love Allah. And you fear Allah and you get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. This is in every concept in life. This is a logical kind of idea. If you want to get close to anybody, that's what you have to do. Now, one of the main things in Islam and who brought this beautiful religion and the message of Islam to us is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why many of the, of the companions, not the companions, but the people who came after them, they used, to say, they used to say, we used to teach our children the seerah and the stories of battles and maghazi, just like we teach them the Quran and the sunnah. It is that important. And the seerah is not a story or a biography of anybody that you know. It is the story and the biography of the source of the revelation that we follow. This is part of your identity, O Muslim. When you know about the Prophet and you know about the story of how the revelation came and who did it come to and what happened, how did it start, how did it evolve, all these things, when you read about it, you're reading about yourself because Islam is a part of you. Sahih, you are Muslim. And you have to know this Islam, where did it come from? So it's very important for a Muslim to know the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I would also say and argue it is very important for the non-Muslim also to know the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, he is the most, I would say, famous and the most mentioned and the most documented the life of someone is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And people today, even the non-Muslims, they are living with Muslims. They are dealing with Muslims. So it is a message for me to them that read the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many doubts will be removed. Many misconceptions will be removed. You will understand Islam truly in its form. And where did it come from? Now, one of the benefits or some of the benefits that we can understand from the seerah, the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that it is the most authentic narrations and story or biography of a Prophet. We know that there were Prophets before the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. There was Musa and Isa and, and Nuh and Yusuf and all of them. May Allah be, uh, may Allah ha, yani, uh, bless uh, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. But we don't have a clear, as clear narration as we have of the Prophet As a matter of fact, we have disinformation of other Prophets, making them as gods. But the Prophet, the story, his biography, his seerah came very clear, very authentic with the chain of narration. That's why many of the scholars today, and we have this is something that we have to be proud of, of, of us Muslims, is that we have the science of hadith, the science of narration. We call it in Arabic, ilmur rijal. So you study every man when he 
gives you a piece of information. Should, is he a reliable source or no? And this is why we have one of the reasons why we have the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ in its complete form because of this, this science. The second thing that about the seerah is that it is so clear of the Prophet ﷺ. No man in history got documented, his life was documented as the Prophet ﷺ. How he looked where he went, what he ate, how he dressed, how he walked, how he spoke, how he dealt with his family, how he dealt with his children, how he dealt with his friends, his companions. Everything, details about the Prophet ﷺ was mentioned in great details. Details, that is in great details. Even the gray hair that is, that is on his beard, they also counted that. SubhanAllah. And this tells us the importance of the seerah, the biography of the Prophet ﷺ. Another benefit from the seerah we can take is that if you read the seerah, you will understand that he was human. He had feelings, he had hardships, he had a lot of problems in life. One time he was poor, one time he was rich, he was trading, he was working. And all the hardships that we have in our lives, the Prophet ﷺ dealt with and experienced. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal qala fi al-Quran, وَلَقَدْ uh, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا There's a, a, a good example for you in the Prophet ﷺ. Then he said, for who and why? لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ If you want to please Allah and you get closer to Allah and you want the hereafter, follow the Prophet, follow the good example, which is the Prophet The fourth thing is that it tells us about all matters of life. He lived as a human, but he had a lot of aspects in life that we can relate to. How he was a father, you should apply it on yourself. How was he as a, as a, as a da'iyah, as a caller to Islam? He was the first da'iyah in Islam, sahih? How should we call to Islam? You should follow his footsteps. How was he as a father? You should follow his footsteps. How was he dealing with in business, in trade? No doubt, all of us today, we work and we're employees or we have a company or we work in a company, we have a shop. He also dealt with these things. How was he? Was he cheating? Was he greedy? Was he, you know, all these things. So you have to follow the Prophet even in that. How was he as a leader? Even not only us laymen, also for the leaders, for the decision makers. If you are a manager, if you are a CEO, if you are a president, if you are a leader of a tribe or whatever you are leading in. How was he as a leader? You also see that in his life. How was he as a friend? For his enemies, how was he? We, met, we all have enemies, sahih? How do you deal with your enemies? Are there rules? Are there ethics? Are there boundaries? You have to know this. The Prophet is the best of examples. He was the best of people and he came with the haqq and he came with the miracles. But subhanAllah, this is from the wisdom of Allah that even him with all his great manners and great attributes and, and characteristics, he had Enemies that are extremely evil. One of them was one of the, his uncles and his tribe's people. They, they hurt him, they insulted him, they tried to kill him, they accused him of many things. And how, do you, how, how did he deal with that? And last but not least, when you read the seerah, you will know that it is proof of his prophethood. And this deen is haqq. Because no man came what he came with and prevailed in such a way and his message was spread all over the world like this. And he is followed until today, 1,444, 45 years later, and his message is growing and growing and growing. I ask you, didn't we see in history and even today people claiming to be prophets? We see that. In throughout history, people came and said, we are prophets of Allah and we have a message. The first thing is that they did not come with something that is truthful. 
Yani the Prophet والسلام, when you look at his message, did he come with something that is unnatural, uh, inaccurate or unfair or unjust? No. He, he came and told you, don't make me a God and don't make anybody a God. You have one God and one creator, worship him. And don't cheat and don't lie and don't harm others and don't harm yourself and be good to people. Is, that, is there a problem with this message? No. He even told us not to be good, not only to humans, to be good to your enemies. Not only that, he told us to be good with animals. He told us to be good also with objects, jamadat. Told us don't waste, don't waste, you know, uh, water. Don't waste anything that is your resources in life. Cherish them, value them, utilize them in the in the right way. His message was that. What was his message? Nothing else. So this by itself is proof that he wasn't a liar. He wasn't crazy. He wasn't uh, a munafiq. Maad Allah and thalik. Because that's the accusations. You have to have like an elimination kind of uh, uh, approach to his message. If he came up with the message. So what is he not? Or let's, let's assume that if, for example, somebody, a, a non-Muslim would say, was he crazy? Look at his message. Does, do crazy people say such things? Crazy people, if, if you work with psychiatrists, they have a pattern. You'll know they're crazy with their speech. You'll understand this guy is not well in his head. They'll start saying things that are not making any sense. But the Prophet ﷺ was making perfect sense. And if somebody would say, he's a liar. طيب أخي, if he's a liar, what is his motive? What is he trying to do? He's trying, to, just for fun, he's lying. يعني. Or he's trying to get money. Or he's trying, what, what is he trying to do? Because we all know the Prophet ﷺ did not ask for authority, did not ask to be worshipped, did not ask for money, did not ask for any of these things. He, was, he lived like a human being, like I said. So this is also proof that he is the Prophet ﷺ. And of course, the scholars, many took care of his, 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 uh, his seerah, his biography. And many of the prominent books, and alhamdulillah today, we have in English and in Arabic and in many other languages. But I would share with you, if you want the details of his seerah, I would, I would suggest uh, the sealed nectar. This is, mashallah, very, very well. And this is what I'm also part of the lectures. I'm following the, the, this book, which is the sealed nectar. And also another book, I don't know if it's translated in English or not, but it's called Al-Lu'lu' Al-Maknoon, The Hidden Pearls in the Seerah. This is also a very good book. Ibn Al-Qayyim also wrote another beautiful book, which is Zad, Zad Al-Ma'ad. And there is also Shama'il Al-Nabi, Shama'il al muhammadiyah which is the characteristics or how the Prophet ﷺ lived his life. Not his seerah, but how did he dress, how did he look, what he ate, all that stuff. You know, the, the, the description of the Prophet ﷺ. Anyways, moving on insha'Allah. Before we get into the life of the Prophet ﷺ, we have to go take a step back and see the environment that the Prophet ﷺ was in. Where did he live? And what happened there? What was the situation and the status of the location he was in? Before he was even born. طبعاً, as we all know, the Prophet ﷺ was not a Persian, was not a Viking, was not a European. Was not, he was an Arab. He was an Arab. And the word Arab, Arab, is actually derived from desert or a land without water and vegetation. This is what Arab means. That's, it's a desert and it has no vegetation and, and no, uh, no water. Now the Arabian Peninsula, you know, the located that's here, which is of course the Gulf and a little bit down. I'm not very good with geography, but you know that the Arabian Peninsula, that place or this place held great importance. This place was, was the center of the earth. And it was also inaccessible for great empires around the Arabian Peninsula. As you know, there were big empires back then, but not in the Arabs. Uh, there was the Persian Empire, which is very, very strong and had a very long history before. And then they had the Romans or the Rome, uh, a Rome, which is also another empire. And perhaps we can also say maybe in Africa, there were also a king, which is a Najashi, who was also 
somewhat of an empire. So it was surrounded by big empires. However, and you know back then and even now, big empires and big countries, they want to invade weak countries. But that didn't happen with the Arabian Peninsula. Why? Because of the accessibility of that place. They wouldn't try, they wouldn't, they, or they cannot, it's very difficult for them to get into the Arab, the Arab lands. It's deserts and it's drought and it's hot. And so they said, no need to go and invade it. Also, there was nothing there. It was just Bedouins living and scattered around the, the land. So what are we, and they didn't have a civilization as, as the Romans and, and the, the, the Persians. You know, there wasn't a king. Do you remember a king of the Arabs? No, it's just tribes and chiefs of tribes scattered around. So they didn't really want this land. And of course, petrol or oil was not discovered back then. So nobody wanted that land. But also, it was like I said, a place of center. And so a lot of trade would happen. Arabs are like, they call them nomads, or they travel. They used to travel around to, tr to trade, to do things. So it also attracted a lot of ideas, arts, uh, concepts, even religions in the Arabian Peninsula. See, by the way, I'm not going to go into great details, but I will, all, I will mention, of course, the important parts of the seerah. The important parts of the seerah. Now I want to talk to you about what I said is that it attracted some religions in the Arabian Peninsula. What was the religion before, originally? What was the religion of the Arabs? It was based on Tawheed, monotheism. It was the religion of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salam. You remember the, the story of Abraham and Ismail? They built the Kaaba and all that. And that religion stayed there. It didn't change. Up until when there was one of the chiefs of Khuza'a. He was called Amr ibn Luhay. And he was a known man. He was a, 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 a man of status in, in, the, in the Arabs, within the Arabs of the tribe of Khuza'a. Of course, as I said, Arabs used to travel. He used to travel to Syria, Dimashq, Damascus. And back then, Damascus was also a very high standard uh, city. Everybody would travel to Damascus for trade, for art, for many things. So when he went there, and he was known to be a man of religion, he was interested and, and impressed with religion. And so when he went to, to Syria, he knew that Syria was a land of messengers. There were messengers there, as you know, Isa and Musa and all that, they were around that place, Palestine, Damascus, all that, it was, a, it was the same location. And so he knew there were messengers there. And also he saw idols, tamathil, asnam, that they were worshipped. So he saw one of the idols and he was impressed, subhanAllah, with this idol. It was Hubal. The idol whose name is Hubal. He liked it. And so he bought this idol from Syria to the Kaaba, to Mecca. And he put it there and he was a man of status. So people uh, looked up to him. So he brought this back. What is that? It is like a part of religion. He's telling them this is part of religion and they used to do it there. This is a land of messengers and I got it from there. So why don't we have it? Subhanallah. This is why we always say in Islam, uh, in ibadat, tawqif. You don't add anything else in Islam as, unless you have dalil from the Quran or the Sunnah because of this. So people don't add up new things in religion and then we go astray. So, uh, he went and he placed this hubal in Kaaba and summoned the people to worship it. He didn't say come and worship it, but what did he say? He said hubal, this is a pious, it's a, it's a, um, uh, يعني, a thing that reminds us of a pious person and this pious person is close to Allah. So we have to seek baraka and call to Allah through this, this uh, idol. And then, of course, the Kaaba was filled with, as years progressed, the Kaaba was filled 
with idols, many idols. As a matter of fact, some of them were dug up in the Arabian Peninsula and some of them were, uh, were taken from other places. And so the Kaaba got surrounded by 360, 360 idols. Imagine when it was back on Tawheed, then it became a place of shirk and polytheism and worshiping other than Allah. Tayyip, some of the features of their worshiping of idols, how did they worship these idols? First of all, they seek refuge to these idols. Okay, they, seek, they thought these idols can protect them because they are salihin, pious people. They were symbols of pious people. So they thought these idols would protect them. But they still believed Allah is one, huh? They believe Allah is the one and He created us. But they seek refuge through these people. They thought that they can protect them. Also performing pilgrimage to the idols. You know, pilgrims like Hajj. They used to do tawaf and the, for Allah and for the idols at the same time. Also, they used to seek favors from these idols. And they used to sacrifice for them. They used to sacrifice for them. And as you know, sacrifice of animals is a ritual and it's an act of worship. So you don't do it for other than Allah. And they had devotion or they would give food and drinks and cattle to these idols. So they say like this food is for the sake of this idol. They give it to them. And today even we see that. huh? Does it all ring a bell to you? Seeking refuge to other than Allah. Sacrificing for other than Allah. Giving food for other than Allah. Sacrificing all that stuff. Pilgrimage for other than Allah. This is still there. huh? In other religions it's there. And also in people who are very deviant from Islam, who call themselves Muslim, they do these things. Till today, huh? 1,444 years before Islam, before Jahiliya times, as they call it, pre-Islamic, it's still with us today. And this is why we say it's very important to repeat and repeat and repeat the matters of Tawheed. Because without Tawheed, then you don't have Islam. Even if you prayed every day, every night, you know, a thousand prayers. It doesn't matter if you don't have Tawheed. This is what Islam was built on. The fifth thing that you used to do with these, uh, these idols is that, that they do vows or oaths, nether. is to do nether for this, uh, these idols. And of course, they dedicate some of the animals for them. They say this animal is for so-and-so idols. And they used to deal with Islam. Islam is kind of like gambling. And it is also something of pretending or claiming of the unseen. And today also I've seen this on social media, which is very, very weird. SubhanAllah, it's like the shaitan is still around, <laughs> right? And it is true, shaitan is still around. Because the same things that people are doing to, uh, you know, to violate their aqidah, 1,444 years ago, it's the same thing we're doing today or people are doing today. Meaning that who's, a, who's behind this? It's the same person. The shaitan. Islam is, they used to take arrows and they used to put three kinds of arrows. One would say uh, na'am or yes, another would say no, and another would be blank. And they used to throw it to decide something. Yani today or I'm going to marry so-and-so woman. They used to do this Islam. They throw the arrow, if it lands on yes, okay, yes. Lands no, no. Today people do that. And there's a lot, many forms of it. I've seen one on, uh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, social media platform, TikTok. Yeah, you, I'm, I'm on TikTok. <laughs> so <laughs> what did they used to do? They put a, a small cup and they say, I'm gonna be rich in five years. And they throw a pen inside the cup. And if it lands, yeah, oh, that's, they do it for fun or maybe they also believe in it. Huh? There is also some kind of level of belief in this. And so this is Islam. This is what the kuffar of Quraysh used to do. This is something that is dangerous. And also, they used to deal with sihr a lot. Dealing with jinn, dealing with magic before Islam. Before Islam. And they used to also believe in superstitions. Tatayyur, we call it. And even today, we all see this. Huh? Everything we see this today. Sihr, magic, you don't... You hear stories of magic and, and mess and dealing with jinn and, and all that. And tatayyur is when they, they used before, they used to see a certain bird. If, he, if the bird flies left, left, then they say, oh, it's a bad day. 
Or if he's going to work and he sees the bird going left, he says, no, this is bad, bad sign. I'm not going to go. Or if he turns right, he says, it's a good sign. I'm going to go. And this is from the Jahiliyyah also. This is from the Jahiliyyah. Now, let's talk about some of the bad things that the Arabs do, aside from the shirk and the beliefs and all that. Arabs back then, before Islam, they were known for drinking alcohol. They drank so much alcohol. They used to even be proud of drinking alcohol and how much alcohol they drink. And they used to write poetry about it, you know, loving it. It's, it's, it's uh, something of pride and something part of their culture to drink alcohol. Gambling was also something that they used to do. As a matter of fact, they used to look down on people who don't gamble. Like he's, he's underdeveloped. Who, is, who are you? We are developed, we gamble. It was a good thing. And they also used to write poetry about gambling. They used to deal with riba. Arabs, the, the pagans of, of the Arabs and the Jews of the Arabs also used to de deal with riba. A person would lend someone money and if he cannot pay on the due date, he will tell him, okay, pay me after, a cert after some time, a month or a year, but pay me more. Riba, basically, or we call it usury in, 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 uh, in English. Another thing they used to do is it was prevalent in the Arabian culture or societies, zina, adultery. Adultery was something that is uh, prevalent there. The, the job of prostitution was all over the place. Not that it is something that everybody accepts, but it was there and it was widely spread. Also a very important thing, and that is something that is, uh, yani, and it was mentioned in the Quran, killing of daughters. The killing of daughters. This was something that is normal with the Arabs. And they used to kill daughters because of many reasons. One of them is because of extreme jealousy. That maybe this woman will grow up and will bring dishonor to my family. So in case, I'll kill her. Another thing they used to also, uh, why they used to kill their, their daughters is because maybe some of the daughters would come, they had maybe a skin problem or a deformity or something is wrong with her leg, she's limping, anything like that, they dispose of this daughter. Allah Azza wa mentioned this in, in the Quran. If you would ask this poor daughter, this little girl who is helpless, who is, has no reason to die, and you choose to end her life, why? It's because of these traditions and cultures and, and baseless accusations or beliefs. How did they used to يعني, dispose or end their lives? In two, two ways. One is bury them alive. This is something, wallahi, inhumane. How can someone have the heart to do this to his daughter? Or they used to also, billah, throw them from a mountain. And sometimes, not only when they were young, sometimes the man is traveling, they travel for months, or he is missing months, years. He comes back and he sees his daughter old. He decides he wants to dispose of her and yani, Islam came and honored women, honored women as women, not like what we see today in, in some cultures, they honor women as men and this is also wrong, Al-Islam wasat, it will honor you and give you your rights but will not go, ex but will not exaggerate. This is the, one of the problems that we have today with societies is they have mixed between man and woman. And that's why we are seeing a lot of problems in societies. But Islam 1,444 years ago gave us the clear instructions on how to deal with a man and a woman. Before Islam, it was a problem. And now because we left Islam, it's also becoming a problem. So these are some of the things that the Arabs would do. And also, 
with the Arabs, they used to have no limited wives. Marry 20, 30, 40 wives, no limit. Islam came and of course gave us a limit to how much we can marry. Also part of marriage before Islam, pre-Islam, the Arabs had four types of يعني, relationships. The normal one that we know. Then they had one that they would, uh, if there was an honorable man in the tribe or in society, and they want a child from the same lineage of that man, they would send their wives, a man would send their wives to that man to have an intimate relationship with her and then come, then she comes back to bear the child of that man, you know, a man of, of honor and sha'an in the tribe. They want the same lineage of that man. They used to also do that. And they think that that's perfectly fine for the Arabs back then. Another thing, of course, is, is the prostitution and all these adultery that would happen in, uh, in the Arabs. Okay, that's the bad part. They had some good things. Arabs also, they're not that evil. But they had some good things. What, what are the good things that the Arabs have? They were very hospitable. Arabs are very hospitable. As a matter of fact, back then, even now today, you'll find these Bedouins, the old school Arabs. If a guest would come to them and they are poor, they don't have food for their children, and they have one maybe sheep, and the guests will come, they will slaughter that sheep for the, for the guest. They will not give their children. My child, let him die of hunger. The guest is more important. He will give everything for him. So this is one of the, the good things about Arabs. Alhamdulillah, we see this also. Today we can see this uh, among the Arabs. By the way, and this is not exclusive for Arabs, but Arabs were known for this. Were known to, to do this, hospitality. Also keeping a promise. An Arab, if he keeps a promise, he will not break it, even if it kills him. This is another thing that Arabs were known for. And sense of honor and denial of injustice. They had honor. Uh, their reputation was everything. And injustice, they used to fight injustice. But of course, you're saying, okay, how they're killing their kids and all. They see that this is not injustice, this is justice. But anything in their standard that is justice, they will protect it and, and fight for it. And they had firm will and determination. And you will, I'll, I'll explain this later. They're very determined people. If they have something in their head, they want to do it, they will do it. And uh, they were pure and simple. They're very simple people. People of the, of, of, the, of the desert. They deal with their sheep or their camels. The very simple lives. So these are some of the characteristics of the Arabs. Tayyib. Okay. We'll conclude with this insha'Allah. Why did Allah choose the Arabs as the final message? Why not India? Why not Persia? Why not Rome? Why not the Vikings or the or Caucasians or whatever? Why Arabs? Taban, I cannot say clear cut the reason because it's not mentioned to us. But the scholars looking at the events and how things unfolded, they told us some of the things that perhaps we can consider why the Arabs. First of all, that they were on the fitrah. They were on their natural yani status. It didn't evolve and change too much. It's as Allah created them. With, you know, in, this, in, the, in the desert, dealing with, with the sheep and the cattle and, and all that. So they were very yani, down to earth, as they say, people. Another thing is that their societies were not filled with wickedness and man-made things. Like... Persia and Rome and India and all that. As you know, these are very old ancient civilizations. Many of man-made things and idol worshipings and many religions came from these, these civilizations. And philosophy, atheism was there in Rome before that. Um, today, India, how many religions there is there? Is there? Many, many, maybe hundreds, right? Hundreds of religions. Why? Because it's an ancient religion. So a lot of these things were like uh, levels of, of misguidance and deviance in these, in these societies that made it very difficult for them or, or way behind with regards to religion. With regards to religion. They're not pure as it was with the Arabs. 
also because of their honesty. As I said, Arabs are very honest people. They will die for honesty. They cannot lie. It's part of them. Also materialism. Materialism, getting so much into life and the, the, the sweetness of this life and perishing and valuing your life too much. They weren't like that. They didn't care about life. Because, uh, you know, civilization and the development of civilization did not reach them. Other civilizations were so much progressed. They had money, they had, uh, you know, technology, they had poetry, they had philosophy, they had many things. So they loved life so much. And on top of that, all the wickedness and the philosophy and all that, you know, the, the things that would misguide them into with regards to religion was there. So it, was, it wasn't the case with the Arabs. The Arabs were not materialistic. As I said, living in the desert. They didn't care about anything. Another thing is that they said they had a lot of great manners and, and honor. So they had a lot of honor. They had a lot of manners when it comes to dealing with one another. And they were fighters and survivors. They were ready to battle. This is one of the characteristics or the things that perhaps uh, Allah chose them to be carriers of this religion, to spread it to the world. And their status was worst with idols at that time. They reached the peak of kufr. They were people of honor, they were people of justice, they were people of honesty. But at that time when Islam was revealed, they reached the peak of deviance and kufr. And I would also add something else finally, is that the Arabs were illiterate. They, didn't, they weren't a, a, a nation of writing. Persia and Rome and all the other civilizations, I think even in India, they would write, document everything. These people were not writers, but they were, had something unique about them. They were speakers. They focused on speech and learning the speech by heart. Memorization was something known of the Arabs. So they wouldn't write, the, everything would be stored in their chests or in their memorization. And this is something Arabs were known for. And perhaps that, those are some of the reasons that Allah revealed to them the message of Islam because it was like a challenge for us is that it will not be documented when it gets revealed, but it will be stored in the hearts and the chests of men and it will be also protected until this day by the will of Allah. And of course, as you know, later, as time progressed after, after the revelation was complete and, and the Prophet wasallam left us, then they started collecting and documenting everything or in one in one book طيب هذا والله اعلم وصلى اللهم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين